morning we're going to uh, continue our study about the family and deal with really the break up of the family. When the vow breaks, and I want to take you all the way back to the book of Malachi, or if you are um, Malachi, uh, chapter 2. Uh, one of the things I hate is that every day across this country, some judge's gavel comes crashing across the bench again, and those horrible words are uttered, divorce granted. And in so doing, it tears apart the family. And in tearing apart the family, it tears apart society. And we are seeing the results of it. And can't quite make out why is it that we are having such problems. And it's because we failed to do what God wanted us to do from the very beginning. I do not like preaching and hurting your feelings with it. But I have to tell you, this morning will probably hurt somebody's feelings, surely. I mean, I know there are those of you, it will reopen an old wound. You've been through it before. You hurt through it before. It will reopen some of those old wounds. I don't like doing that, but it's important for us to understand about this issue of divorce and remarriage. I think it will frustrate some of the others of you, especially if you're sitting here this morning, even though maybe nobody else knows it, but you're thinking about getting out of your marriage. You really want to get out of it. And you're not going to necessarily like to learn the hard lesson that you really are responsible for that decision you made and that vow you made, and God doesn't make it easy to get out of it. Some of you will think that I'm way too hard on the issue. In fact, some of you will wonder if I have a heart at all. Too narrow because I tell you, and you're going to discover, that God does not have an easy out divorce scheme. He doesn't at all. And I'm going to take you to what he says, not what the world says. And then finally, some of you will uh, think that I'm too easy. Too easy on the subject because uh, you have decided maybe that there is no biblical exception to marriage, but there is. We have to discuss it. We have to talk about it. Some of you won't like that, but that's next week. This morning I want to talk just one basic theme through the book of Malachi. I want you to understand it's not about all of the books. When we were discussing this at uh, Grace Community Church in uh, California when I was there, uh, we had some guys who brought a lot of books on this pastor says it's easy to get out and somebody else brought a lot of books about no, divorce is, is hard and you've got to make it hard and there are no easy outs. And great, you, i got lots of books in my library. You can pile up books on either side of the question, but there's really only one book that is important. Only one that matters. I understand that there are other interpretations. Mine may not be the right one, although I think it is. Because I think God makes it pretty simple about his attitude about divorce and remarriage. It's more difficult when you get to those exceptional things, which we'll look at next week. But we're going to look at what the Bible says. And someone may, may say to me, well, from what you're saying this morning, then I could just uh, go to any church around and get whatever answer I want to get. Yeah. I'll tell you, you could. If you want a divorce and you want to make it easy, there is somebody in town who's preaching that. So you could go there. But what I want you to understand, folks, is that you are responsible for the decision you make and for how you think the Word of God treats that decision, no matter what anybody else says. You're responsible for it. And that's why I want to teach you what I think the Word of God is pretty clear about and why God has set up marriage not to fail. He didn't make it fail. We allow them to fail. And He doesn't give us something we can't bear. We come into the counselor's office and say, I can't do this. Well, you, you can. You don't. And some of you haven't. And I'm sorry if it makes you feel guilty again, 
But let's look at the passages together. The issue itself is really very simple. It's only very difficult when you get in the human element. Very simple when we look at it from God's perspective. Very difficult when people get into the feelings get, and get into, well, do you know what she said to me? Do you know what he did to me? Do you know what our kids, do you know what we're having to put up? You know, when you give it the human perspective, it's very difficult. We'll talk about some of those pains next week. I mean, I have my pains too. As much as, as I love this woman, she's not perfect. And I can tell you something else. <laughs> Would you really want to live with me? Uh-uh. Well, let me tell you, it's not easy to do. Where have you been? It's been so quiet here for the last few weeks. I haven't seen you. I'm glad you're better. <laughs> Amen. Well, let's go to uh, the last book of the Old Testament. Well, I've got one other lady here who wants to say something. Why is it that God can't just make the whole issue clear? Why all these, why all these little exceptions and why? All, it, say it again. He does. He, does. <laughs> he makes it very clear. But what you and I need to understand, folks, is that God makes the issue clear and He does not legislate sub-ideal behavior. He doesn't say, this is the ideal. Now, if you don't like plan A, let's go for plan B. Uh, no, no, not plan Okay, I've got a plan C. Oh, you've got a bigger problem. Well, how about plan... No. God sets down the ideal. He doesn't go into all of the other details because he does not legislate sub-ideal behavior. Now, with that in mind, I think we're going to finally get into Malachi. Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, God says it very clearly. Very clearly. He doesn't stutter. It's not that he spoke in Hebrew and you can't understand it. We have it translated into English. God said, I hate divorce. It's as clear as that. I hate divorce divorce. But I think I need to take you to the passage, all of it, and see what was going on there and show you a little bit of why God said what he did. So I'm in Malachi chapter 2. I've given it to you here or if you want to follow along in whatever version you have. Malachi chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3. We'll start there. And now this commandment is for you, O priests, so understand this in the context. God is talking to the spiritual leaders of his people. And he says, if you do not listen, and if you do not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. And indeed, I have cursed them already because you are not taking it to heart. Behold, God says, I am going to rebuke your offspring and I will spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your feasts, and you will be taken away with it. Whoa! I mean, talk about starting out hard. See, I, I got to fill you in on the details here. This is God's people after they have come back from the Babylonian captivity. We call this the post-exilic prophet, Malachi. This is after they've come back. They have a temple again, or at least they're working on it, but it's not like Solomon's temple. Things are not like they were before. And even though they're back in their country, and they're back supposedly doing what God wants them to do, something's not working. The, the, the blessings from God are not there. And, and, and when they pray, it's as though their prayers aren't getting anywhere. And God speaks to their spiritual leaders and he says, it's because you're not taking my word to heart. You, you've gotten cold in, in your response toward me. And so this is what he goes on to say. In verse 13... This is another thing you do, he says. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears and, and with weeping and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering. 
or accepts it with, with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Well, God, God, why aren't you blessing us like you used to? Well, why are you not answering our prayer? What, what have we done? He says, because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Now, in context, he's talking to men. He's talking to the Jewish religious leaders. But don't let that throw you. The context doesn't necessarily take away from what he's saying about marriage. He's dealing with these men who had made it very easy to get out of their marriage vows. It is true, women in those days didn't have much freedom to do much of anything. But boy, were the men taking advantage of it, and especially the priests. And to them he speaks, and he says, verse 15, Not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. You're, you're divorcing your wives, and you're doing this, and you're saying, Oh, by the Spirit of God, all oh, by God's Spirit, that was their saying. And basically he's saying back to them, don't you dare say that what you're doing is what my spirit told you to do. It is not. Do not say that. It gets harder. He goes on to say, take heed then to your spirit. Not my spirit. My spirit didn't tell you this. You take heed then to your spirit. And let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and, and him who covers his garment with, with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So you take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, how have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? Uh, they were basically saying, look, we're doing what God wants us to do. We're doing what Moses commanded us to do. We'll pick that up in Matthew 19. We're, we're, we're pleasing the Lord. He says, no, you're not. You're doing wrong. And then on the other side, you're saying, where's the God of justice? Well, why is he not blessing us again now that we've come back from from exile, so they couldn't understand that, that God could not bless them because they were not doing it His way. I can tell you again and again and again, if you do things God's way, He will bless you. If you don't do things His way, you don't get the blessing. And people so many times come to me and say, why, why does my life feel so empty? And then we get to the issue of, well, what are you doing with your life? Uh, what is your relationship like with God? How is your prayer life? How is your devotional life? How is your obedience? It gets down to that. So we come to the end of the Old Testament. And God ends all of the Old Testament with, with His a basic purpose for life and marriage, and it was what he felt about divorce. He says, I hate it. I hate it. Now, let me put a little, uh, little thought in here. At the same time, in Jeremiah, we read that God divorced Israel. Ten tribes. I just want you to think about that. I hate divorce, he says. So we come 400 years later to the time of Jesus. Time of Jesus, 400 years after God says, I hate divorce, and it's just as bad. It's gotten no better in Israel. Uh, even though they've gone into captivity, they've come back. Now they've had the 400 silent years from God. He's not answering their prayers. He's not listening to them. There hasn't been a prophet... Uh, until John the Baptist came on the scene. And then here comes Jesus. In this climate, 
the religious leaders were doing the very thing they were doing back in Malachi's day. Uh, divorce was rampant. And it was especially rampant in the religious leaders. And there, there were reasons that they had for that, things that they said. And, and it brings us then to Matthew 19, where they confront Jesus on the issue. So let's notice Matthew 19, verse 1. When Jesus had finished these words, he's been preaching, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. This is moving toward the last uh, few months, days of our Lord's ministry. He's going to go from this area, move into Jericho, and then move up on into Jerusalem, where everything will come to a climax. And they will kill him for what he said, for what he believed. For what he taught that God said. So we're moving to that. Right now we are in his Perean ministry. He's down in this particular area. Keep that in mind because it makes a difference here. Verse 3. Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Is it, is it lawful? It was a trap. It was a gotcha question. It was exactly what they wanted him to answer. Not only answer, but answer here in Perea at this spot. You see, because uh, in the background of this issue was what they were trying to do to Jesus. Well, let me tell you what was going on here. First of all, this is the last part of his ministry. He's in Perea. He's heading toward Jerusalem, as I said. And the area where they confront him is noteworthy because somebody lives there. It just so happens that Herod Antipas lives in this area. This is the man whom John the Baptist had said of his wife, it is not lawful that you have her because she had been Philip, his brother Philip's wife. She was also his half-sister. He said, it's not lawful. You remember what happened to John the Baptist? <laughs> oh. Right here. Right here in this place. Maybe, maybe Herod will be listening to what Jesus has to say here. And so there was, um, uh, there was some disagreement on what a person should believe at this time, but most of them particularly believed in the writings of Rabbi Hillel. Rabbi Hillel was the more liberal of the rabbis. Now, at this time, he's been dead about 20 years. But Rabbi Hillel, in going back to what Jesus said back in Deuteronomy chapter 24, said that a, uh, a Jewish man had a command... A, a reason to divorce his wife if she did certain things. Because after all, Moses said if there was any indecency in her, he commanded them to divorce. Here are some of his reasons. If she burned your dinner, she burned your dinner, you could divorce her. By the way, these are all things that he had listed. For spinning around so that someone saw her ankles. Immorality. You could divorce her for that. For speaking to another man. Yeah. For making negative comments about her mother-in-law. Your mother. Mm -hmm. Do you know how often that has happened in history? <laughs> for talking in a voice to her husband that was loud enough for the neighbors to hear. That's enough to divorce her. And then finally, he said, if you found another woman you like better. So, so you've heard of no-fault divorce. Hey, Rabbi Hillel said any fault divorce. And, and he said Moses commanded it. He told you to do it. Because after all, you have to keep up with the laws of Moses. So you can see how rampant the issue was. So verse 3, 
Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And after all, Rabbi Hillel had said, You could. Rabbi Jesus, what do you say? And they knew what his answer was going to be. They had heard him before. They knew what he would say to them, but they wanted the crowds to hear him. They wanted the people to hear this strict, horrible, conservative view that God hated divorce. And, and certainly Jesus was going to say that, and then the crowds would want to kill him too, as they were prepared to do. And also, they probably thought that Herod Antipas might hear it, and he would do the dirty deed for them. So here's Jesus' answer. Any reason at all? Verse 4, he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Do you, do you understand what a jab this was to these religious leaders who were supposed to be experts at the law? Hey, have you never read Genesis? Huh? You, the religious leaders, the experts. Do you, you know what an expert is, don't you? An X is a has-been and a spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> have you never read that, what God said? And then he goes on in verse 5, and said, and here we come to this verse, folks, I keep telling you, it's found five times throughout the Word of God. You've got to understand how important it is. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Pharisees. Haven't you read that? That's right from the beginning. His first point here is really a point, an issue of accounting, an issue of numbers. He said, when you have God's way of numbering, you have one man, you have one woman, you have Adam, you have Eve, and the two went through a sacred ceremony with God, and the two became one. So they're no longer two. Now, if you take the one and you break it apart, you no longer even have one. So basically what he's saying is God made marriage so that it is indivisible. You do not take that one and divide it and have half. No, no, no. No, God took two, made them one. You divide one, and it's really nothing. So his point is, God said, don't do it. Secondly, he says, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. His point here is also pretty clear. There it was a matter of accounting, the numbers. Here it's an issue of authority. He says, God... The God of the universe, the God whom you say you serve, the God who rules over everything. God, the supreme authority, says, I've joined them together. Man does not have the authority to separate them. So his point is that issue of authority. Man does not have the authority to divide what God has put together. Simple principle of accounting, simple principle of authority, this is what God has done. Now, they should have understood that. They should have accepted what he had to say. Verse 7. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not this way. You asked me about God's purpose. And I'm telling you from the beginning, God made them male and female and said the two shall become one. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. But they said, uh, but wait, 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 wait. Moses commanded us to do this. 
I want you to notice the difference in the words they used and the words Jesus used. They're going back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, and we'll take a look at it next week. But they were saying, Moses commanded us to divorce our wives if there was any indecency. He commanded. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Let me change your words. It's not a matter of semantics, but you've made it that. No, Moses permitted you. When we go back and look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, they were divorcing their wives. But when they just sent their wife out, what did it look like? It looked like this woman obviously had committed adultery. And if she committed adultery, what was the judgment stoning? He said, you can't do that. You've at least got to give her a certificate of divorce to say why you are sending her out. Moses permitted it because they had such hard hearts. It was a way of keeping it from totally getting out of hand. But it did anyway. did anyway because now they are taking it that Moses commanded them to divorce their wives. The disciples. When you look at the response of the disciples here, they listen to Jesus and they go, wow, what is this? They are so bewildered at his answer. And I know they've heard it before, but here in the presence of the Pharisees, notice, verse 10, the disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. You mean you can't get out of it that easy? They understood what he said. But he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. I take it he's talking about only those who had a relationship with God, who cared about what God said, who wanted to please God. For there are eunuchs, meaning those who are born without ability to have uh, reproductive rights. Uh, those who are eunuchs, from, they were born that way from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men through castration. And then he goes on to say, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, they have remained celibate, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. See, not to marry, and you have to understand his point here. Not to marry meant living the life of a eunuch. Now remember, this is all man-centered here, male-centered. They said, it's, it's better not to marry. I don't know any other way to say, we got any little children here this morning? No. What are you saying? Okay, don't marry, but you get no sex. Be a eunuch. You, sure, you don't have to marry. But do you understand what he meant by that? If you're not going to marry, you have the life of a eunuch. What he meant was, and I have two important points here that you shouldn't miss. What he meant was, number one, monogamy is God's will. God didn't mean for you to get out of one marriage and then go into another. God didn't mean for you to go one woman to another. He didn't mean to play musical beds. Monogamy is his will. You're not going to marry? Okay, be a eunuch. Be celibate. And then secondly... Morality is God's will. In other words, marriage is the place where that physical relationship takes place. It's not before marriage. It's not when you get out of a marriage. Monogamy is God's will. Morality is God's will. Paul says it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is God's will. Your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Porneia. Sex outside of marriage. Very clear. I want to remind you. I want to close with what Jesus said. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. I want you to notice what he did not say. He did not say he who wants to accept 
this. He's talking about the person who wants to please God, who wants to be blessed by God, who wants to live for Him, who wants to know what His will is. Now, don't miss this point as we close. Do you want God's will? Or do you want your will? You remember when Jesus told us how to pray, gave us sort of a model. He said, you pray this way, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, it's done. It's always done. The ones who didn't go according to God's will, they got booted out of heaven. In heaven, God's will is done. The issue for any, when, when we get to this issue of divorce and remarriage, it really comes down to this issue. Do you want to do God's will? Do you want to do His will? But, but wait a minute. Jesus mentioned an exception. Aren't you going to deal with that issue? Yeah, next week. In fact, we'll deal with lots of exceptions next week. In fact, we may have to go two more weeks. But I'll deal with that. But until you come to what is God's basic desire... And God's basic desire is, I hate divorce. I made it from the beginning, a man, a woman, once. Well, there is another one. God, uh, Paul says, after death. And then he says some other things. So we, we do have to deal with the exceptions. But until you understand and you really want to do God's will, then you basically have to hop from church to church to find your will. So we'll be talking about that next week. But I want to close with this. Do you want to do God's will? Let's pray together. Father, we ask questions about making life easier.